so what is this exciting new phenomenon that uh, is going on in Kendall Square? There's significant new job growth. Uh, the auto traffic is not significantly higher, uh, and uh, although I think there's some questions about the causality. Uh, my friend Jeff uh, from the Cambridge City Government is here, uh, Jeff Rosenblum, who talks about how traffic on Massachusetts Avenue and Broadway hasn't gone up. Of course, how could it go up? It was already totally congested. That's why it hasn't gone up. Uh, with the addition of the bicycle lanes, uh, capacity on those streets has gone down. So it is constrained in its capacity to get automobiles into the Kendall Square area. What's made it work, if you count the numbers as opposed to just looking visually, is not the number of people on bicycles. They're very visual and visible. Uh, but if you go out and count them, they're not nearly as numerous as you would think. What makes Kendall work is the red line. Uh, and uh, we need to be serious not just about directionally correct uh, insights, but we have to be dimensionally correct. We have to put measurements on these things and be sure that the quantities make sense. I love walking. I lived in Naples for you with my wife. We walked everywhere. But if you live your life only on a walk-to-work basis, you better be prepared to accept a medieval lifestyle where the local dawn controls your whole life. <laughs> transportation gives you choice. The choice to not use it, but the presence of the transportation means you're not captive of one job, one industry, and Cambridge runs a serious risk of Kendall Square becoming a very not just a boring place, but a place that is a death trap if you look at it over decades, if you look at what's going on elsewhere. So where did this opportunity come from? Largely the opportunity came, and the problem with some of these physical things is they take decades uh, to develop. So it's very hard for the political process to reflect on the fact that things are happening today because other things happened 30, 40, and 50 years ago. Unquestionably, the first was equity. That's what put the passion into the fight. Father McManus organizing people in Central Square with hundreds and hundreds of other names. Uh, Dan Hayes, who was the mayor at the time, is, and, and, and later Mayor Barbara Ackerman were particularly important. But thousands of people getting together to defend their turf. The memory of the West End, a really nasty memory, was not far behind us. And against the majority of the city council, um, against the city planning board of Cambridge, against the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, against the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce, all who said, you know to have an economy, we've got to build the inner belt. And those of us who were fighting, and to be frank, we were fighting over the housing and over not seeing the neighborhood turned into another West End. That was where the passion came from. MIT used its tax-exempt power as an educational institution, which gave it a huge competitive advantage over private sector people to acquire real estate in the dying businesses, the manufacturing that was moving out, the warehousing that was moving out, the simplex wire. So MIT used that competitive advantage allegedly for educational purposes, and I think in some cases probably sincerely for educational purposes, at that time, to pick up the real estate to reach Kendall Square and begin giving the cachet that there was technology here. Now, it may be that there are too many high buildings in Boston, but there's no question that the Boston economy is thriving. Now, at the time of the fight, the Chamber of Commerce and all their allies, the City Planning Board of Cambridge, City, the BRA, all of the wise people were saying, you're gonna die, the economy will die without the roads. The middle theory, but you can reach your own judgment. But for sure, the Chamber of Commerce and the City Planning Board in Cambridge was dead wrong. Gentrification is going on in several dimensions, and it's quite terrible. Gentrification is going on in housing, it's going on on research space, it's going on in innovation space, and it's going on in this weird celebration of no children households. Now, some of my best friends have no children. I'm not against people without children. But communities are interesting 
that have a mix in them. And a community without children, where the schools are hollowing out, loses its sense of community. I love students. I mean, I, I teach them. I, I really enjoy them. They're here for a couple of years, and then they move on. And that, that's understandable, and they contribute while they're here. But there needs to be a base that they're contributing to. If the whole community is cycling in and out in two and three years, no one has a stake in the future that's going to fight for a better environment and fight for better schools. They're not going to become involved politically if they're here today and gone in two years. The biggest driver of gentrification in Cambridge is MIT. MIT had a strategy for decades of housing 50% of their graduate students on campus. In my view, it was not adequate, but it was a strategy. There were two, Bob Simha told me yesterday, who was the former planning director at MIT, there were 2,000 dwelling units, 2,000 beds of housing on the books ready to go when he left. MIT dropped that policy. And just the difference to 50% from, they claim 39%, but they're leaving out the postdocs. They're down around 30%. Subtract 30 from 100, figure out the math. There are, if MIT were housing 100% of its postdocs and uh, graduate students, which I think in this economy is the appropriate level, that's 5,000 beds. The lack of that housing, those students, very nice people, are, they are the blockbusters, they are the agents of gentrification because they will live in more density and they will pay rents that no family can afford. That's what's the, the shock troops of gentrification is, and I'm not blaming the students, it's MIT as an institute which has disgracefully failed to step up to the plate of providing housing that its own function relies on. MIT cannot function without those uh, research associates. It's disgraceful. I work for MIT. They can throw me out if they want to. Oh man, I don't give a damn. <laughs> what they're doing is reprehensible. Uh, the jobs at Kendall without housing, I like to see the jobs growing, but if you don't add especially transit, you've got a problem. Uh, how are you going to get the people there? You're now forcing people to walk. That's nice for their health, but it means if they have to walk, they're going to push someone else out of that housing. So the lack of transit and the lack of housing is a double whammy that's very bad. MIT in particular is the driver of the problem in Cambridge for that part of the problem. And Danielle says, Grandma, you're so nice. That would be so good. Uh, or Danielle, when she dropped her fork, said, Grandma, I'm full. Marianne says, if I cut it up, would you like it? She said, that's so nice of you, but I'd still be full. <laughs> now, she understood at five years old something that our planners don't understand. <laughs> the red line is full. If we don't do something about the red line, the number one bus is full. If we don't do something to significantly improve the transportation system, we're going to blow this thing. Okay, I think this is really good. <laughs> At the council the other night, uh, there were some intervening items of discussion. Uh, there was uh, two pieces of that. One of the things MIT did at the last minute to capture a vote on the council was commit to a project labor agreement so that they use union labor in the construction of the new buildings. My family are all craftsmen. I served an apprenticeship in the bricklayers. I negotiated the first project labor agreement in Boston on the big day. I believe in them. If you believe in it as a matter of principle, it's one thing. MIT did it as a tactic at the end of the game. The proof of that, the same night at the council, there was a gentleman who spoke in Spanish and was being translated for because the People's Republic of Cambridge has contracted out uh, the custodian services at one of the libraries. And the guy was begging, they've lost, to a non-union contractor. The guy was begging that the current employees be able to keep their jobs. Now, we contracted out in the 80s for cleaning services at the MBTA because the cleaning was not getting done. Some people wanted to save the money. I didn't want to save the money. I just wanted stations that didn't stink of urine. That was my objective. We, <laughs> built, objective. In, we built in our own prevailing wage because the cutthroat competition, the second, first round of bids, we got clean stations and respectable contractors. Next round of bids, 
the cutthroats came in with marginal wages, no health benefits, it was outrageous. And I said, we're a public agency, we can't do this anymore. We adopted prevailing wage uh, for custodial services. You know, don't tell me Cambridge can't figure out how to do that. It was terrible to see this guy begging for the jobs of these people in a different language. On the business about immigrants, some of my students came to me last year looking for help to design a bus route from MIT to Somerville so they could access cheaper housing. So I said, so you want to drive the Brazilians out of Somerville? Why don't you march on MIT and demand some housing instead of chasing another round of immigrants out? I mean, there are ethical consequences to these things. And, and yes, in a perfect world, there'd be a lot of funding and things would be different. In the world we live in, MIT could make a huge difference. And we ought to insist that they do. It's not going to cure the common cold, but it could be a lot better than it is. students are now the shock troop, which is causing the problem. So you need to remove that, uh, that impetus to the gentrification that's going on. And MIT needs those grad students. They are going to keep coming. MIT cannot function without the grad students. So they're going to keep coming. And the affordability, the, the rents in Cambridge, I believe, jumped 7% last year. They're spiking. The vacancy rate is lower than any place in the United States except central Manhattan. So the, the graduate student, dealing with the graduate student housing problem is a necessary but not sufficient condition. If MIT would recognize the damage it's done in abandoning the old 50% uh, strategy, they owe at least a thousand units of affordable housing for the general community in Cambridge, and I testified to that effect. The 60 is an insult. You know, 60 units out of 300, the 300 is an insult, it's nowhere near enough housing, and the 60 is an insult. I'm not saying throw them away, I'm saying insist that they put an appropriate dimension on this for the need that they're driving and the amount of money they're gonna get out of the upzoning that they were allowed. If you don't link it now, you've lost all the leverage, and I think the Cambridge City Council other than Minka, blew it by going along with that without driving a hot bargain. I, I don't know if they could have gotten 100% out of MIT. They sure as hell could have gotten more. Now, MIT, to be a little optimistic, the president, because of Jonathan King, who's here, really, and, and a lot of organizing by Jonathan in particular and other people at MIT, I'm a late, Johnny come lately on this thing, put enough pressure on the administration that the president committed to a task force to study housing needs. Now, if that study screws around wondering if there's a housing crisis, it's disgusting. They should begin with the premise there's a very serious housing problem, and it should focus on how to deal with it, beginning with the 2,000 units that Bob Simha left in the pipeline. This is a very cynical game that we're playing with here, and we've got to, we need pressure on MIT for that task force to come up with something decent. If the council <coughs> had withheld their votes, there would have been pressure helping the task force get to a more reasonable number. And secondly, I'd like to talk about the value of downzoning as well as upzoning. I support upzoning in Kendall because it has the potential for much better public transportation than it now has. The reality is it's getting pretty full. Central Square does not have anything like the potential of Kendall. And it is much more like, and I walked down through Central Square. I was not attacked by a single four to five story building. They, they were smiling at me. <laughs> there was a two story McDonald's that must have known I was a vegetarian, so it kind of smiled at me as I went by. <laughs> it's a very nice place to walk through. It's not boring like Harvard Square. What this, we've seen this bad movie before. In the 70s, when Ward Zuckerman, wanted to upzone the Park Square area of Boston. And people in Back Bay Beacon Hill fought against Shadows on the Common. Governor, new, newly elected Governor Dukakis asked three of us in the cabinet, Evelyn Murphy, Secretary of Environmental Affairs, Bill Flynn from Communities Development and Meet from Transportation, to try to negotiate something. We put the transportation building there to generate jobs and foot traffic and let the private sector do the rest. But part of doing the rest 
we noticed during the process that the word that the zoning was going up led to a series of fires of suspicious origin in some of those beautiful old buildings along the common and the garden. So we adopted as part of the plan an absolute height limit at the then current roof line. And I, and I said publicly, because I tend to say what I think, you can, you can burn down your fucking building, but you're not going to be able to build back a single story more than you already have. So think carefully, because you ain't going to get that up zoning. So the down zoning, I think, is where go to Go to Park Square. It didn't solve gentrification. You get the Four Seasons Hotel and the Heritage. But it did solve the arson problem. If you up zone, if you up zone in Central Square, I think there's a really serious risk what happens to those buildings. If you down zone and say the limit is one story, unless you do affordable units, in which case you can go to four, and organize a transfer of development rights that they could confer on Kendall to go even higher, so you could make that housing affordable. You need 100% affordable housing if you're 80%, some big percentage, not 13% or 14%. You need real quantities of affordable housing if you're going to hold this thing to continue to be a diverse, uh, diverse community. But down zoning in Central Square, I think, is absolutely, from my experience, it works. Uh, and it, it ought to be on the table as, as a strategy. Up zoning could backfire very badly. It was backfiring very badly in Boston. And more recently, look at Menino and the disaster known as Filene's. Finally, it's turning around. We had a hole in the middle of the city because of up zoning and letting an unscrupulous developer who couldn't even pass this. This, the casino standards, the right. Coronado just withdrew from that, he got control of the heart of the city and was extorting the mayor for more height. So be real careful with upzoning as a strategy to deal with an area as important as Central Square. Okay, I agree completely, but to keep the focus on MIT, which is the institution here that we're right. talking about, the reason MIT's numbers look as good as they do is because of the old 50% policy that was abandoned about a decade ago by the current Matimco organization. So as Bob Simha, the guy who managed this process for a long time said, and by the way, they're bad-mouthing Bob. There's a whispering campaign, which is disgraceful, because he's, he, he, he understandably is upset that his life's work is being upended. And my view was it wasn't enough, but it was way more than anybody else was doing. And those positive numbers, or numbers that MIT spins as being positive, are only there because of the work that Simha did. The expression he used recently at MIT was, they are drinking from wells they had nothing to do with digging. And that is basically always happening in these phenomena that take long lead times. Nobody remembers that we wouldn't have an innovation district in Boston or this interesting thing going on in Kendall except for the decisions that Frank Sargent made 40 years ago. That's a real political problem with a lack of connection between cause and effect. The other piece of the MIT thing is the city council was putting money in MIT's pocket by the upzone. This land was acquired by MIT using their tax exempt power, and MIT made assurances to the federal government this was going to be used for academic purposes. I question the wisdom of the change, but if you're going to change and let them use it for commercial purposes at higher density, then if not now, when are they going to step up to the plate with 100% housing for their, they could really lead by example here now, and the city council just gave them the money to do it. It's a question of setting, of treating it as a priority. And that's MIT. You know, Forest City is just the front. so. There is a real obligation here that, is, that we should at least call very serious attention to. You know, they're not the cause of every problem in the universe, but here in Cambridge, when you think about things that are proximate, what could happen, MIT could make a huge difference here. MIT can and should be that pioneer on the net zero that would do a favor not only for the buildings at MIT, it would do the nation and the world a favor by developing the technique to do it. But you can't ask a developer who's having real trouble making the, you know, the bottom line work on affordable housing 
to get innovative on something like Next Zero. MIT could and should be the pioneer to do it. That's why I thought what Mika proposed was so terrific. And why, I, I, the, sorry to be a broken record about MIT, but MIT is the one that has a unique need for the graduate students. Graduate students are nice, but the research functions at MIT cannot happen without those graduate students. It's a much more inherent part of the MIT enterprise, which is important not just to MIT, but to Cambridge. It's that research that's attracting the Novartises and everybody else. So the, the functional need, the, the, to hold MIT to the same standard as Northeastern throws away a lot of leverage and it's inappropriate. MIT needs the graduate students more and Northeastern did not just get a huge gift from the Cambridge City Council the way MIT did. So now's the time to get MIT to really set the bar very high. And I don't think you could expect the same high bar of the Northeastern because they don't have the same need and they don't have the same financial resources. Amy has something.